Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and our first questioner is Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taken to close the gender pay gap. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises that the gender pay gap is symptomatic of structural inequalities in the workplace, uh, as well as education and wider society, and that's why we are tackling the issue on a number of fronts. We have established a gender pay gap working group that will be chaired by the Minister for Employability and Training, which will identify specific actions to reduce gender pay gaps across sectors as a key element of the government's inclusive growth vision. And the Minister for Employability and Training has also written to the chief executives of those public bodies subject to Scottish Government pay settlement to urge them to continue to work towards reducing pay gaps in their organisation. Julian Martin. I thank Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government does not have the levers available to, that the UK government has in terms of employment law, but it does procure a lot of services from Scottish companies with contracts worth a substantial amount of money. One of the recommendations of the Economy Committee's gender pay gap report was for government to look into including a declaration on the gender pay gap for company tenders to win government contracts. We also recommended that work be done on improving the gender element of the Scottish Business Pledge to encourage businesses to actively tackle their, their pay gap. Is the government doing any work on this? And would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that equally paid women would inject billions into the Scottish economy? And that's a potential we can't afford to ignore as we seek to grow that economy. Cabinet Secretary. I very much agree with the last point made by Gillian Martin and also the first point about the uh, basis on which employment uh, powers, where they lie currently and the ability to take action on that. So those are two uh, very important points on which I, I would agree. In relation to the other point that's raised by Julie Martin and in relation to the business pledge, yes, we are conducting a full review of the business pledge with one exception of the nine different criteria which are applied there, which relates to the living wage. We're not changing uh, our position on the living wage, but every other aspect of the business pledge uh, is being looked at. And we've had a number of discussions, including myself, with uh, a round table with, with businesses to look at those uh, different elements of the business pledge in order to make sure that it does achieve the wider aims including those aims that uh, could be taken forward by use of the government's uh, procurement powers. Procurement lies with my colleague uh, Derek Mackay. So these things are being taken forward. It's worth pointing out, of course, that the gender pay gap is far too high at 6.6%, but remains in Scotland well below the UK's level of 9.1%. But we are intending to take further action to make sure we can drive that down uh, further to achieve the benefits which Julie, Martley, Julie, Julie Martin rightly alludes to. Kezia Dugdale. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that bonuses and partnership dividends aren't counted into the gender pay gap calculations. I understand the First Minister is attending the Finance Sector's Gender Summit in the summer. Could I ask the Scottish Government to raise that with the Finance Sector, particularly as when you do factor that in, the pay gap in the Finance Sector can be as high as 40 to 60 per cent in some companies? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, happy to pass on uh, those comments to the First Minister. I would say that, of course, in relation to dividends and many other aspects, these are covered by uh, powers which are reserved to the UK Government. They do have the powers to take these things uh, into account to a far greater extent. And wouldn't it be far better had we got those powers that we could take action directly? But I am willing to say to uh, Kezia Dugdale that, of course, we'll pass on the suggestion that she's made uh, to the First Minister. Question number two, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with media industry regarding the role that it can play in challenging Islamophobia. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to challenging Islamophobia wherever it arises in Scotland. Last year, we supported Interfaith Scotland to host an event for media platforms and uh, Muslim community leaders to explore how Muslims are represented in the media. Last summer, we published our Tackling Prejudice and Building Connected Communities Action Plan, an ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime and build community cohesion. The action plan contains a commitment to engage with key stakeholders, including social media platforms to consider further steps to prevent and tackle online hatred. We will be holding an event later in 2018 to consider these issues more fully. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last night, the cross-party group on tackling Islamophobia met leading figures of the broadcast and print media eh, for what was a very frank and open conversation and an action plan has been agreed to go forward, which is very positive and welcome on all sides. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the platforms of social media, though, which clearly remain a challenge. One of the proposals put forward to the First Minister back in January, which I'm pleased she accepted, was to hold a social media summit to look directly about Islamophobia and other forms of prejudice. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when that's likely to be and which organisations would be included? Cabinet Secretary. 
pleased to hear about the event last night and in terms of the commitment for the broadcasting media and print media. Um, I'll be very keen to monitor that action plan along with my, with my colleagues that are dealing with uh, the inequalities in particular and communities. Um, in terms of the event, I will make sure the member knows. I can't tell you at this point in time when the event is, who will be attending, but I'm more than happy to share that with him and others who have a, a particular interest in this. Uh, it is about tackling hate crime. It's, the tackling about, uh, it's also about tackling uh, some of the other representation issues and uh, can I also share the members in relation to my discussions with Ofcom and indeed other media outlets, uh, positive portrayal as well as tackling uh, hate crime is also something that we need to make sure is covered as part of this action. Question number three, Alex Rowley. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether lack of initial infrastructure investment is a barrier to new housing development. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Government is committed to increasing the supply of housing across all 10 years. And while the majority of housing sites are able to progress, uh, we recognise that infrastructure provision can de delay delivery of some sites in some locations. Uh, we are therefore pursuing additional planning and investment measures to improve the delivery of infrastructure affecting housing supply. Reforms to the planning system proposed in the planning bill are designed to improve the coordination and delivery of infrastructure with development planning and our housing infrastructure fund and building Scotland fund are substantial investment programmes that can provide financing support to help unlock housing infrastructure blockages for key sites. Alex Rowley. I thank the Minister for that answer. I know the Minister understands why we need to get every bit of house building moving. I know he understands the opportunities, the skills and the jobs that will come from a national programme of house building. So for the life of me, I do not understand why he's brought forward a planning bill that, in my view, does nothing to address one of the main barriers. Will he think again and have discussion with the industry and with local councils, all of whom are saying that there are major house developments being stalled right across Scotland because they are lacking front-loaded infrastructure for, in particular, schools, education and health? We need to get house and moving. Will he have those discussions with the industry? President officer, I uh, have discussions with industry and local authorities uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and in terms of the planning bill itself, uh, we have introduced the enabling power for an infrastructure levy, uh, which I think will go a long way to helping in some of these regards. But beyond that, as I've already highlighted, um, we have the Housing Infrastructure Fund, uh, which has unlocked sites in areas such as Granham and Aberdeen, Dumbeg and Argyll and Maryhill Locks uh, in Hamilton Hill in Glasgow. Um, uh, and I will continue uh, to have discussions, as I say, uh, and we will look to improving the situation as we uh, move forward. Christine Graham. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Following on from Alec Rowley's question, uh, would the Minister give consideration to the Section 75 process in planning, including where appropriate provision for community or health centres? Minister. Um, Presiding Officer, uh, historically there has been some caution um, expressed around using obligations to secure provisions such as uh, dental practices, community surgeries or GP surgeries. surgeries which are often uh, privately owned. Uh, in some areas such as Forth Valley and Grampian, uh, this has been addressed by requiring uh, that any developer contributions uh, for these things are transferred to the NHS to address capacity deficiencies identified and not directly to GP surgeries. If Ms Graham uh, wants to speak to me further, I'm more than happy to talk to her about how that's happening in NHS Forth Valley and NHS Grampian. Question number four, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government if it has any plans to meet the new administration of the Murray Council? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. I met the new Council leader on Tuesday. Richard Lockhead. Well, that was an early meeting and a very positive sign of a new working relationship. Uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will want to reiterate my congratulations to the new Council leader, Graham Ledbetter, and the first female convener of the Murray Council, Councillor Shona Morrison, uh, and their colleagues. And is he aware that they've inherited a very difficult legacy issue after over 18 years of the other parties being in charge of the Murray Council? And these issues have been compounded by a Conservative Party austerity, uh, not least the fact that £13 million a year has been removed from Murray through welfare reform hitting families uh, across the area. So will he continue to work 
with the Council on these very difficult legacy issues uh, and pledge to do all he can to help the people of Murray in the difficult times ahead. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will pledge to do that. I met the previous uh, administration, indeed uh, the, the all parties in the Council on a cross-party basis. I welcome the fact that the new administration has very much hit the ground uh, running and I look forward to providing assistance where the government can. Of course, local government received a very fair uh, settlement and Murray will have to tackle those legacy issues and I look forward to positive uh, cooperation so to do. I call Jimmy Halter Johnson. Thank you. Does the Minister recognise a figure published recently by the Scottish Parliament's own information centre setting out the Murray Council has endured £106 cut in funding over the last five years for every man, woman and child in Murray? And when he met the new uh, SNP colleagues on Murray Council, did, he, did they make representations to him about these cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, local government's very, very uh, fair settlement from Scottish Government. Of course, in the last two years, that's included uh, real increases to local government as well. Of course, if I had followed uh, Tory advice, it would be tax cuts for the richest, not more investment into yeah, the public services yeah. uh, of uh, Scotland. I do recognise, however, of course, that the Tories are changing their tune on taxation, uh, but this government has properly funded uh, local government and will continue to ensure that we support our local services as well as the transformation that is required. Uh, but it could be argued, of course, that many of the issues in Murray are as a consequence of the neglect from some politicians in that area, and not least the Conservatives. Yeah. Question number five, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the implications for wildlife in Scotland, what its response is to the joint study by the Mammal Society and Natural England, which states that almost one in five mammal species in Britain is at risk of extinction. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government uh, welcomes the report. This is the first substantive update about the number and range of these species in the UK in 23 years and was commissioned jointly by SNH, Natural England and Natural Resources Wales. It highlights the need for further information and a better understanding of some of our native species and we will consider the results as we work to improve how we protect our native mammals. I thank the John Cabinet Scott. Secretary for her answer, but she will know that the report has found that a total of nine of Scotland's mammals have been categorised as critical, endangered or vulnerable. A further six have been listed as near threatened. Can I ask what action the Cabinet Secretary is taking in order to halt the decline in these species in Scotland and what measures she is taking to ensure that biodiversity as a whole is improving across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the, uh, the member uh, would probably welcome uh, some of the action that has already been taken. A, a total of 11 species were assessed as at risk in Scotland. Uh, one, the Scottish wildcat critically endangered. The polecat is endangered. Uh, there are four vulnerable species, the Nathusius pipistrelle, that's a bat for those who are not aware, hedgehog, uh, orkney vole and otter and five near threatened. But I have to say that of these three show population increases, hedgehogs, water voles and polecats and six are actually stable or increasing in range in Scotland and that's mountain hare, otter, water vole, red fox, red squirrel and hedgehog. So I, I think with that, we feel that the society's estimate of one in five nearing extinction, at least insofar as Scotland is concerned, is an overestimate. Um, I have much more specific information available for individual species, but I fear I would run afoul of the presiding officer's no, he's timing he's rules, off, he's off and I will ensure that the member gets the more detailed information about individual species uh, that he may wish. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree we must do all we can to protect existing mammal species. Water voles, Arvicola amphibious, have declined by 94% in the UK since the 1950s. However, the discovery of thriving populations of water voles in Glasgow province, far from their traditional habitat, is considered to be of national significance and has been studied by academics from Glasgow University. Will the Scottish Government factor this endangered species into any policies it develops to protect mammal populations? Mr. Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just say, however, that when we're talking about species loss and biodiversity, uh, it's perhaps not really a matter of great joking uh, and laughing. And I'm just a little concerned that people aren't actually taking this seriously. 
Um, can I thank Ivan McKee for his question about water voles? Um, I have actually seen a, a recent uh, report, in fact, I'm sure it was televised, showing the fantastic work being taken, uh, uh, undertaken by Glasgow City Council, SNH, and Glasgow University. Researchers are still trying to understand why the Glasgow water voles have managed to switch to living in grasslands. And the Glasgow Water Vole Project is a three-year partnership between the University of Glasgow, Glasgow City Council, SNH, People's Trust for Endangered Species, and the Seven Lochs Project will carry out further research. And those findings will help inform future habitat and population management guidelines and allow developers to regenerate areas of the city in a way that allows water voles to flourish alongside people, which is something I'm sure everybody in this chamber would want to see. Question number six, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding what action can be taken to tackle second, secondary ticket sale for events. Cabinet Secretary, fill his uh, The Scottish Government fully appreciates the concerns expressed about the deliberate resale of tickets for profit, known as touting, and recognises that some events do sell out quickly and ticket touts or online sellers take the opportunity to sell tickets at significantly higher prices. Powers in relation to secondary ticketing are reserved to Westminster and we cannot bring forward any legislation in this area under the current constitutional arrangements. We welcome, however, the provision in the Westminster Digital Economy Act 2017, creating a new offence for criminalising the use of ticketing bots to purchase tickets in excess of a maximum permitted amount. Scottish Government officials are continuing to keep in touch with officials in Whitehall on this to ensure a positive outcome for Scottish consumers. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that secondary ticket sale websites are exploiting music fans with unjustified and inflated prices? And while recognising that consumer protection law is reserved, has the Scottish Government fully explored all options around using the regulations which stopped ticket touting at the Commonwealth Games to tackle tickle sorry, ticket touting at music events employing an argument that their reputation also needs protection. Minister. <coughs> Minister. There are obviously specific uh, regulations in relation to the Commonwealth Games. Can I uh, explain to the, minister, the, the member that the regulations under the Digital Economy Act uh, come into force in July uh, 2018 and they will be enforced by the police. Uh, Professor Waterson's 2016 report uh, accepts the view that greater enforcement of existing measures is needed. The Competition and Markets Authority have agreed undertakings for three out of the four main uh, sites, and so enforcement action uh, may, I understand, follow for that outstanding site. Question number seven, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to prevent violent crime in Inverclyde and Renfrewshire. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, violent crime is totally unacceptable and since 2006-07, the number of violent crimes has fallen by 68% in Inverclyde, and by 62% in Renfrewshire. Uh, alongside tough enforcement, our approach to violent crime is very firmly focused on prevention. We have already invested more than £14 million in violence prevention since 2006-07, including support for the National Violence Reduction Unit and Medics Against Violence, who work to develop and deliver various violence pre prevention initiatives, including the accelerated delivery of the Mentors in Violence Prevention programme being delivered in schools across Scotland, including in Inverclyde and Renfrewshire. And finally, presiding officer, I would say that we also continue to invest in our No Lives, Better Lives at Youth Engagement Programme. This is being rolled out uh, across Scotland. It has already been delivered in 24 local authorities and is on track to be delivered in all 32 local authority areas this year. Neil Bibby. Thank the Minister for that answer. On June the 5th, I asked the Justice Secretary what he would do to ensure that Key Division for Renfrewshire and Inverclyde has the resources it needs to tackle an increase in violent crime, including increased knife carrying. He said this was an operational matter and gave no commitment to further resources for the division. This is a very serious issue and people in my region want assurances so that the kind of high intensity policing needed to stamp out violent crime and weapon carrying is maintained. Can I ask again uh, the Minister what assurances the Scottish Government can give that sufficient resources are made av available to the police in my area? Minister. Of course, the Cabinet Secretary uh, is uh, kept surprised of any issues of concern raised by Police Scotland. I'm not aware of any specific issue being raised by Police Scotland with regard to the, the matter that the member specifically uh, referred to. But, of course, uh, we remain open to any 
uh, approaches in that regard. Of course, we had uh, proposed increases in our budget, which, of course, the member uh, voted down increased resources for Police Scotland uh, across Scotland. The member didn't seem to support that. But I would reiterate on the key issue of, uh, in, in terms of prevention of violent crime, uh, of course, um, violent crime is uh, down. Uh, knife crime is down by 68% since 2007. And we are determined to continue to tackle violent crime and keep people safe. Further to the investment of £14 million in violent prevention projects, it may interest the member to know that we are also seeking to have further detailed analysis carried out about uh, the characteristics of violent crime in Scotland today in those places where there still are persistent pockets. That will be looking at the, the factors behind violence, what may be changing, what is needed to secure further reductions, and that work is ongoing and will report in due course. Thank you very much.